Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the SATE webinar for NQTs, hopefully talking to you all about what to do in your first year teaching, what not to do, what to avoid, and some um, top tips for different people. Uh, my name is Tom Coles, and I'm going to be hopefully uh, working on all the technological aspects of today's talk um, and introducing you to the people who are going to share their expertise with you today. So um, we are running until about seven o'clock. Um, we will have time to take questions. So please leave your questions in the comments and I will check them up on screen for our um, participants um, as they, well, as they want to answer them. Um, just really quickly to run through what we're doing today, we're going to talk about what to expect, things to remember, possibly more importantly, things to forget, um, what to do on your first day um, and your first week uh, and maybe thinking about later on in the year. We have some fantastic people joining us today. Um, but before that, before we get to them, um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what SAIT is. So SAIT is the Scottish Association for the Teaching of English, saying that a bit too quickly. Um, and we are part of the UK-wide National Association for the Teaching of English. Um, NATE was formed in 1963 out of a London organisation which formed in 1947. So we've been around for a long time. And really, SAIT is an organisation that tries to focus on the child in English teaching, um, respon being responsive to the experience, interests and language of students. So we are an organisation that's focused on English teachers and literacy teachers um, across the different ages and stages. Um, but the session today is really focused on NQTs. And I think a lot of the things we're going to be talking about are going to be relevant for everyone. Okay, so moving on quickly, who have we got for you today? Um, unfortunately, you've got two pictures of me. Um, Sharon Loder, who's going to be the first person to join us, doesn't look like that, thankfully. Um, I've not updated that slide. So you have myself, Tom Coles, and we have Sharon, who is a uh, initial teacher education teaching fellow. Um, we have Leanne, who is a mentor and an English teacher. We have Connor, who is a probationer, who's just finished his probation year. And we have Amy, who is just starting as a probationer, and they are more prepared than me, not cr crossing those T's, dotting those I's. Um, we will aim to have a question and answer session at about 6.45. So um, I might lose some comments. We do have over 400 people watching right now. I might lose some comments. So if you have a really good question, save it maybe for the end at 6.45, and we'll definitely be able to pick up some of the bigger questions there. But please answer questions that you see in the comments if you know the answer to other people's questions. And please, it's great to see people engaging in those comments. OK, really quickly, what are we going to talk about today? So each of our participants um, is going to talk for about five minutes. Um, and we think it's really interesting to hear from people um, what are their experiences of school. So did you enjoy school when you decided you become a teacher? Were you thinking, oh, I, I loved it. I had a great time. I want to go back. Or maybe you've got the idea that you want to change things about education. Um, what was your journey like to teaching? I put a question up on Facebook earlier on, uh, and it seemed like about a third of the people who are joining this webinar um, are between the ages of 22 and um, 25. So I can imply from that that they've, they've started their journey towards teaching quite early on in their lives. But we still have a significant number of people who are joining who are in their late 20s and 30s and also people's in their people in their 40s and 50s, so who may be joining after having a different career. And I think it's really interesting maybe to talk about the difference, different experiences there. Um, we're going to talk about initial teacher education, so whether that was through the PGDE or other methods that people might have done. Um, and then each person is going to talk a bit about their probation year um, and their experiences in NQT, um, if that's applicable, and also maybe some advice for early in their careers. Um, and then really, I think it's always interesting to talk about the values in education. So what do people think is important in education and maybe a bit of general life advice for what to do in a community of teachers? OK, a little bit about me really quickly. Um, I am a member of SAIT. Um, I completed my PGDE at Strathclyde University in 2015. Um, I'm currently a high school English teacher on the Isle of Skye, and I've just completed my uh, master's in education uh, on the topic of developing the young workforce. Um, not so interesting, but, uh, but you know, it took a while. Um, I'm currently seconded to Education Scotland as well as the G Suite in Glow product owner um, supporting the teaching profession. That's a one day a week post where I'm talking about um, digital learning and digital technology. So we've all got used to that over the last wee while. Um, an interesting role. OK, um, Sharon, just to introduce Sharon really quickly before I bring her in. Um, Sharon qualified in 1996. She'll tell you all about this. Um, 
in, through a scheme that was prior to the current teacher induction scheme. She spent 22 years teaching English and media, but for seven of those years, she was the faculty head of English. She had a PT role. Um, she's worked in the further education sector and is currently a teaching fellow for the PDD English course at Strathclyde University. So, Sharon, hello. How are you today? Hello there, Tom. I'm wonderful. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, NQTs. It's very nice to see so many people involved. Um, so I've had quite a long journey with education. Um, I didn't come through the initial teaching, um, the initial the, the probation route because it didn't exist back then. You were basically sort of thrown to the wolves and you had to seek out um, posts in supply or um, you had to find a, a permanent post. So it was a quite a different landscape. Um, my journey towards teaching was quite a strange one because, <laughs> believe it or not, I was a school refuser <laughs> and I hated school as a child and um, I didn't have a particularly good time. And it wasn't until I got sort of halfway through university that it started occurring to me that actually one thing you can do to sort of put something back is to try and address some of the things that went wrong in your own education and try and do something about it. Um, so that's the reason I got into teaching. I really wanted to have a positive influence on young people and children. I did it for 22 years. And um, I have to say, I think I read somewhere actually that um, between year eight and year 21, you tend to be at your most effective. Um, I don't know if that's, um, if that's still current research, but um, I did feel that it took me a few years to get into the swing of things. Um, I have noticed from some of the comments that I've had already um, that one of the things you're going to want to talk about this afternoon is behaviour management. And you will have heard lots of people saying this to you already. It's not be behaviour management, it is relationship development. Um, I think if you go into teaching thinking that the children will have to be controlled by you, you're sort of setting off on the wrong foot. Um, you'll have heard all these ridiculous rumours about uh, establishing yourself as a teacher, um, i.e. don't smile before Christmas. I think you must know by now that that's just a lot of nonsense. That's um, that's a scare story. You do smile before Christmas. Um, I think one of the things that I would do straight away, because um, I did take on that advice and I became a bit of a harridan, to be honest with you, and a bit of a, an episcity. Um, and I didn't have to be. Um, I realised as I've, I've, I've made my way through the first two or three years of my, my teaching career that meeting the children at the door, smiling, making eye contact, um, letting them know that you like them and that you're enjoying being around them makes all the difference. So um, I, I guess I don't really talk about behaviour management. I talk about relationship development. I think you're also all going to want to talk about workload this afternoon. Um, and it does concern me sometimes when I look on Twitter and I look on, you know, some of my own WhatsApp groups. I'm in, in education circles. Um, people tend to share success stories or, or um, you know, things that are going well. I would say as a community of NQTs, I think that's something you've got to watch out for. I think I would share failures as much as I would share successes because that is going to um, put out a realistic view of things. I think um, people can sometimes feel a wee bit lonely on social media when they see that things are going well for people. Um, and I think if you make yourself vulnerable in this, this um, situation, a vulnerable, not, not vulnerable as in weak, but a teacher who's willing to admit that they're making mistakes, and a teacher that is willing to admit that they can learn as much from the children as the children will from them, a teacher that's willing to say sorry, a teacher that's willing to say that didn't go as well as it should have done, will we talk about how that's going to get better, is actually going to be a much stronger teacher in the long run. Um, so I, I would say basically two things just now, don't think about behaviour, think about relationships. And in terms of your workloads, try and not give the impression to each other that you're, you know, everything is jazz hands all the time. It's it's okay to be taking some time off just now, especially over the summer. And it is okay to not be getting everything right. Those are my first sort of kind of open opening me gambits for you. I think that's really important. Um, and I was really interested to hear your experiences of, of probation, which which is very different to, to what a lot of the people watching today will be um, going through. And well, going through makes it sound terrible, doesn't it? But we'll be experiencing over the next year. Do you think the initial teacher scheme is an improvement from your experience? Do you think there's something lost there or, or something gained compared to maybe your experience? Absolutely gained. 
um, when, it, when I first came out, I actually went to initial teacher training in 1995 with an eight-month-old wow. uh, son. And, I, you know, I was, I was really just a wee girl myself. Um, and whenever I came out at the other end, it was a case of sitting from half past eight in the morning, phoning around supply, um, supply pools. That, you know, that's just this idea of being able to fit in somewhere and be somewhere for the duration and to make relationships and to make your mistakes in quite a safe space. Not having to go around, you know, developing new relationships and making mistakes is a great thing. So I'm so supportive of the, the induction scheme. Yeah, I know there were some people commenting, um, some NQTs commenting that there's, it's been a bit disrupted, obviously, with the coronavirus. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that um, with some questions later on. So just thinking about, you know, it is difficult after probation year finding, uh, you know, a role and a position. Um, and there are definitely improvements. I, I know there's been a a, um, a, uh, a letter going around to John Swinney talking about that. So we can maybe talk about that sort of thing later. OK, so th the way we're going to run the rest of this session, thanks for that, Sharon, that was fantastic, is we're going to be bringing in sort of um, um, some of our guests. And really, Sharon's going to be the interviewer here. Uh, she's going to sort of take over and I'm going to try and grab some comments and things like that. So the next person that we're going to bring in um, is Leanne Welsh. So Leanne is an English teacher in the west of Scotland. Um, she's a mentor. So she's um, going to be the sort of person, hopefully, you know, that you're going to meet in your departments when you start at your school um, and has recently taken on the role of the co-student regent um, uh, she's voluntary network lead for the West Partnership, and she also has blogged in the past as an NQT at nqtreflectionswordpress.com. Um, so just going to bring Leanne in now. How are you today, Leanne? Hi there. Yes, I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Um, it's, as Sharon said, it's great to see so many people involved and, and wanting to learn and develop. Really exciting. Yeah, really, really good. So I guess about I guess the first thing to start off with is is your journey to teaching Leanne. So were you sort of a wee girl or wee boy? Um, you know, we all start off that way sometimes. Um, or did you do work beforehand or how do you come to school? How do you come to teaching rather? So I actually um, worked at McDonald's for about seven years. Um, I became a crew trainer and then a manager. And through through that experience of coaching, um, helping others, developing staff, it made me think, do you know what? I think I could I could be a teacher. So um, I had my I had my degree in English literature and English language. I enjoyed English at school. Um, one of the subjects I didn't enjoy so much was maths. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else can relate. Um, so you know I, I dreaded going to maths. Um, I was anxious about being in the class. Um, uh, they tried to at one point move me um, to a lower set and I got really emotional about it because I was the kind of person in school I tried really hard I liked school um, but I just in general struggled with that subject so when now as a teacher I always think to myself how are pupils in my class feeling um, and I think that was that was a really key thing for me as well when I when I thought about starting teaching was I want pupils to feel safe in my class. I want pupils to feel respected in my class. I don't ever want anyone to feel the way I did um, in, in the maths class. Um, it was, you know, pretty pretty bad experience with maths. However, um, really enjoyed English. Um, as I said, McDonald's made me think I could do teaching. Um, so I had to obviously go back to college and get my national five in um, mathematics. But I achieved that uh, one day a week in West Lothian. Um, totally bombed my prelim. Thought there is no way I'm going to get this. I uh, applied to Edinburgh and Strathclyde. Uh, Edinburgh wanted a B and I thought, well, <laughs> there's no way that's going to happen. So I um, ended up going to Strathclyde, was really pleased with Strathclyde, was really pleased with my um, initial teacher education experience, the PGDE for the year. I found it challenging and no way was I a natural. Um, you know, it really took me time I had to reflect um, I had to think about the constructive criticism that was given and um, I really appreciated teachers who were kind in terms of the feedback they gave me but also honest and I think that's really key and I think as a as a mentor I always strive to to be that way I, I strive to be kind supportive but at the same time we all have areas that we can improve on um, as well in terms of my NQT year um, I had a really positive experience. I felt that I was now in a position that I had my own class. Um, I had, I was lucky enough to have my own classroom as well, had my own classes. Um, I felt that 
I was able to develop relationships with pupils. However, I was the same as Sharon in the sense that I started off with this idea of, you know, you can't smile until Christmas. And I think that's something that we really need to forget and move past. I mean, we've, we've progressed past that now. We no longer have or should have a culture of shouting at pupils in the class. Um, it should be, you know, a very, very purposeful environment, a safe environment, and having conversations with pupils is much more valuable. Understanding how they are feeling is much more valuable than thinking we can use our power to um, make them feel manipulated, make them feel scared. And, and that's, as a teacher, I always keep that in mind. Um, in terms of NQT year, I was very hard on myself in terms of workload. Um, during the summer, I produced all this work that I actually ended up not using um, because I didn't know the pupils yet. So I think that's a key thing for NQTs to remember. You don't know who you're teaching yet. You don't know really unless you speak to your principal teacher, the needs of the classroom. You don't have a feel of your classes yet. So please be kind to yourself over the summer. Take the time to relax. Get involved in these CPD events, which I think are fantastic. There's quite a lot going on just now, which is online. So I would recommend getting involved with that. Um, also do some reading. Um, you know, there's some great books out there to do with subject, to do with behaviour management. Um, that's that's what I would recommend doing. And just relaxing um, and taking the time to just think about, reflect on your PGDE or your, you know, whatever journey you had in terms of your student year. and don't be too hard on yourself. In terms of when I was an NQT, I also gave myself a couple of weeks before getting involved in everything. I think there's this tendency to dive in and I think it's really good um, to get involved in the school community, but I would recommend giving yourself a couple of weeks. So get the learning and teaching, build the relationships with the pupils, then start getting seen around the school. You know, go along to the canteen at lunchtime, get involved in a club, maybe start a club with a couple of other NQTs um, so you can work together on something. I would also recommend meeting up with NQTs um, for once a week for a lunch and just reflecting on your experience too. So um, so yeah, I think, I think those are key. In terms of um, just quickly my values, really important for me for people to have a voice in the classroom. Um, as Sharon said, relationships are key you know, make sure that you're building those with pupils. You will enjoy the classroom. You will enjoy being a teacher more. The pupils will enjoy having you as a teacher more um, and you'll get more out of them. That's that's from my personal experience. You'll get more out of them by doing that. Um, in terms of English teaching as well, I make sure that pupils have a chance to share their own interpretations before I um, tell them my views. So just encouraging a critical eye, encouraging pupils to think for themselves is really key. That's fantastic, Leanne. Um, really, really good sort of overview and especially having values in education, I think is really important and being being strong with those because it can be it can be difficult when all the you feel like all the weight of the, the world is coming down on top of you. Um, I guess for Sharon and Leanne, um, you guys have both had experience as being heads of department and, and mentors. Um, what's I suppose what's your approach to supporting, you know, younger teachers in the past? And, you know, what can what really should NQTs be looking for when they go into a department? What questions should they be asking? Uh, what should they look for? You know, the book cupboards, these sorts of things. <laughs> what advice would you give and, and how would you approach supporting NQTs in their, their first few weeks and in a department? Well, I was um, I was a mentor um, when when I was before I was promoted, and I think it was probably I think you'll maybe agree with me, Leanne, just a total privilege, and a, a really lovely job because you you don't you're able to just build this this very niche relationship. Um, one of the things that I would always kick off with is just as I said to you guys at the very start, I kicked off with all my mistakes. Um, I think a good mentor is going to be going, I haven't nailed this. And the, the thing is, you'll never nail it. You're never going to get it completely right. So I think if what I'd be looking for from a mentor, if I was asking mentor questions um, at the start, what are, what are the biggest mistakes you've ever made? If you were to be in my position right now, what would be your your your, your biggest advice? Um, and I think all relationships flow from that exchange, that exchange where you make yourself vulnerable and you say, um, 
this is a tough, tough job. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we've all have had teachers that were brilliant and we all had teachers that were terrible, but the teachers that we thought were brilliant, they had bad days as well, and they went home greeting, and they got into the wine. Everybody does it. Nobody's perfect. So I think the best pitch is to try and let your mentor know that you know what your weaknesses are. Be really clear about that from the start. You've had so much feedback during your initial teaching year. Um, you should be able to articulate up front, these are the things I need to work on. Were those things that you had to work on? And then you might build that sort of reciprocity out of there. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Sharon. I think that's key is being able to identify your targets. Um, you know, taking taking on feedback that you received in your um, PGDE year, but also I think as well. I mean, I was I was an NQT that was very very hard on myself um, to the point where I could only comment on the negatives. Um, so what was so good about my mentor was she was more of a coach. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that I've taken on board from her was, you know, I would say, oh, I think I could have done this, I think I could have done that. And she would say, right, but what did I ask you for? <laughs> and, I would, and then it was the positives. So I think keeping that in mind um, is really key. I would also say never be afraid to ask questions. Your department will expect you to, to have, have questions. Um, we're teachers, we're, we're caring, we want to help people um, and there will be people in your department who will be your go-tos um, and who you feel comfortable with and, and who you, you want to seek questions from and, and don't be afraid as well. I remember sometimes someone would explain something to me, for, for example, the systems in the school and then I, I, they would say, this is how you do it and I'd say, right, that's great and then they would walk away and I would have no idea. <laughs> And I would then need to go back to them and just say, would you mind just explaining that to me again? And that that really, really helped. Just just feeling comfortable, um, you know, making yourself known in your department. I think, you know, there's make sure you, you get around, make sure you introduce yourself to people in your department, make sure they know who you are. And then if you do that at the beginning, you'll then feel very comfortable talking to people, asking questions of people. Um, and I think I think that's a really, really beneficial thing to do. I think it's worth saying at this point um, that a, re a, a standard question in interviews for positions, for, for, for teaching positions, a standard question is what would you do in the event that there was um, a, a problem in the classroom or behaviour issues or communication issues? And the answer always, always is I would go through the, the departmental or the school um, process for that and then I would ask for help. It is not seen as a weakness to ask for help. It is seen as a professional behaviour. Mm -hmm. so it's worth saying. Yeah, I agree. I think it's definitely professional. And it's part of being a teacher. We're constantly growing. We're constantly reflecting. Um, there's never a point where I, where I think to myself, right, that's it. I've, I've got that now. I don't need to think about it anymore. There's, there's constantly learning to be done. Um, I'm just, there's a question here as well that we could maybe, um, I'm really looking forward to having my own classes, but I'm used to having to run lessons past teachers in my department. Is this still expected of me during my probation year? Um, I would I would say for that, from from my experience, um, no, you know, you, you might want, you might feel comfortable just saying to people, is this, do you think this is okay? This is what I'm planning on doing in my first few lessons. Um, you will be observed. So you will have lessons where um, teachers will come in, your mentor will come in, and um, maybe your head of department will come in. The deputy who is overall in charge um, will come in to, to see you and you'll be expected to show lesson plans for that. However, as far as I'm aware, when I started in August a few years ago, it was very much, you've got your classes now, you're ready. But still, if, if there's something you want to check over with someone, I still do that now. I still check over parts of lessons with colleagues to see what they think. Um, and, and that's that's fine to do. But it's, it's I wouldn't say it's expected. I would say that it's slightly different from the student training year where things are quite heavily monitored. And I know that can cause problems. It can cause real tensions. Um, as you move into your probation year, as, as a former PT, I would want to have um, an eye on the coverage that every member of staff was expecting to do, just sort of the arc of the year, if you know what I mean. This is what I'm going to do this novel, and from that I want a critical essay. Uh, I'm, you know, this is how I'm going to do the personal writing bit. This is when I'm going to, you know, 
I'd want somebody to be able to articulate to me what their plan is. My expectation as a PT and as a mentor in the NQT year is that the the individualised planning for every lesson is not as onerous as it is in your student teaching year. But heads up, different mentors and different schools will take different approaches. So you kind of have to be prepared for whatever the situation is in your school. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I would say to you if, you, if you feel that it is too much and that you're being over monitored or over, you know, ha having to do really excessive planning for everything, talk to somebody else in the department. If it's a PT, maybe go to the, the student region or the NQT region in the school and just say, listen, I'm not to complain about somebody, but to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the way that it's meant to be. Um, do you have any advice for me? Is there anything I can do to adjust here? But try and build relationships where you can get answers about what really should be expected. But that's a good question, Ailey. Um, I think it is one of the big, big difficulties of working in a department when you're new to this is yeah. being upfront with people about what you're doing, but still not to be too bogged down in detail the way that you maybe are in your student year. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree. That's really great advice, I think, is, you know, really it's about communication with the people in your, in your school and, and, and finding those people who you can bounce ideas off and, you know, go to, you know, if you've not had the best day ever. Um, and also going to and celebrating when you do do things really well, because, uh, you know, it's a surprise sometimes when you walk into a school and, and all these teachers have been teaching for 20 years, look at you like you're going to have some new ideas and they're going to be excited about maybe things you've learned at, uh, um, in your training that you want to bring or something you've done in another school and a, gr a good department will will definitely be um be willing to take that on board as well i think um that was fantastic we're gonna we're gonna bring um our next guest in and actually i think probably both of you could stay in to chat with them for a, for a while um just to introduce them uh really quickly. So our next guest is going to be Connor. Um, Connor's just completed his probation year in North Ayrshire, um, where he's been very fortunate in, in terms of securing a permanent uh, post starting in August. Um, he completed his English literature degree with the Open University and his PGDE at the University of Strathclyde. So um, if I can actually find him here. Hi, Connor, how are you? Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Yeah. Great to see you. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess you're coming from a, the, the perspective of quite a lot of people who are joining us today to watch the, the webinar. Um, you've just completed the year that, that they're going to be starting in August. Um, and I guess it'd be interesting to hear, you know, that's quite an interesting route, actually, um, distance learning through Open University. You obviously, you know, had a lot of advice for the kids on how to deal <laughs> with it during the coronavirus lockdown. Um, do you want to just tell us for a few, uh, a few minutes about, you know, your experience of school and... And yeah, then, so I grew up uh, in East Ayrshire, went to school there, and since third year of school, I decided I want to be an English teacher, and that was always my my go-to, was from there, I want to become an English teacher. So once I left school, straight into university, and I tell this story to my pupils often, because I dropped out of university after two years, and um, I went to Glasgow, it wasn't for me, I wasn't ready, and I dropped out, um, and then I worked for a wee while, I worked different jobs and then decided, right, I need to get back to what I, need, what I want to do. I want to teach English, so I'm going to just go through the Open University. So I joined them, uh, worked hard for three years, got my degree, and then did my postgrad with Strathclyde. Um, it was fantastic. I tell that story to my pupils a lot just because a lot of them are stuck in this mindset of, I need to go straight, straight out, straight into more education. And I tell them that just to emphasise that there's not one path. That's something quite big in North Ayrshire, there's not only one way to get where you want to go and they do find that quite relatable. And it's important that as teachers we we are relatable and I found that out really quite early on in my probation year that the best way to get those pupils on your side and build those strong relationships that everybody's talked about already is to be that relatable person. Let them know that you're there for them, you're a human being as well and that you've got their best interests at heart. Um, my probation year started out very normal. I went in, I did my introductory lessons. I started off with a lot of group work where I would get to see how they all worked in groups, so who worked well together, so who chatted a lot together, who I had to split up. Um, and that was how my first week was structured. Everything was done in groups so that I could just get a feel of how the class worked as a whole. And then I took it from there. So I did a lot of team kind of exercises at the start but I've had a very positive probation year it's been really good 
That's fantastic. Connor, you, you almost preempted the question I wanted to bring in. I'm going to hand over to Sharon and Leanne as well, um, just to talk about, you know, experience of probation. And maybe it'd be interesting to hear any things that didn't go right, Connor, or um, or things that you did that went really well. Um, there's a question here from Hannah, um, and I've blocked everyone else out here accidentally. Um, do you have any suggestions for what sort of texts or pieces of work to start off with classes is a good introduction to the start of term? So it'd be interesting to think about that, I think. Can I pitch in just now? Because I think this is quite a um, it's quite a unique year for everybody. Everybody's going back to work after COVID nineteen, and it won't be after COVID nineteen. It will be living with COVID nineteen. And one of my slight concerns about the new school year, and I've been talking to my partner, who's a, an English teacher as well, is that we don't overload kids with um, infection chat. Uh, I would maybe avoid going in to do what, how did you survive COVID? How was your COVID experience? You know, there's a real temptation to do that because, you know, as English teachers, we want to elicit these really strong visceral experiences and get really good writing from them. And what I realised um, a couple of years into my teaching career is I was making a fatal mistake that everybody makes, which is after Christmas, you would come in and say, how was everybody's Christmas? And you just... Yeah. I think it's such a, it's such an easy mistake to make. We're all human, but there will be pupils out there who have su suffered severe trauma. Um, they've been cooped up with people. They might have experienced bereavement. So I would maybe just not bother with that. But I completely agree with Connor. I think getting them into groups, seeing what the how the vibes work. So if you can devise some group discussions, um, I think that might be that might be a good way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you completely, Sharon. Um, I was the exact same. I would think, right, okay, let's have a, a letter or something about um, your Christmas experience or your summer holiday experience. And, you know, as soon as you realise, as soon as somebody says, why are we doing that? You realise, why Why is that something that I do? I would also say in terms of um, text and starting off of the year, and Sharon picked up on this before, is double check with um, your department. See if there's a structure that your department follow. Um, I'm, I'm from an experience where I've I have quite a bit of freedom. Um, you know, there was maybe set areas that we would cover at certain times of year. So just double check that and see if there are points of the year where certain things or certain elements, for example, creative writing um, or, you know, a, a novel, etc., where I see if that's covered at a certain point. But if you have freedom, um, then I would say uh, something that I quite like to do, as Connor said, get them into groups, get them talking, get them discussing. Um, I quite enjoy creative writing with them, so but giving them quite a bit of freedom with that, just to get a sense of their writing. Um, the pupils the pupils enjoy it as well. Um, so that's that for me personally, that's something I, I tend to start the year with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I would agree. I think as well, sometimes if you don't want to start off with a, a text, you can still do something to gauge their kind of prior knowledge, what these classes actually know. Just ask questions like, right, what is a plot? And get them to write down a wee definition of what they think plot is. And then that way you can see where our body sits because you've never met these kids before. That's something that's on the back foot going in as an NQT. You don't know who these children are and you need to try and learn about them so quickly and what they have done and where they've come from. And so I think even a couple of wee prior knowledge tasks can work as well. I think something that happens in English departments a lot is that they tend to start off, especially in the first year curriculum, they tend to start off with personal writing as a way of getting to know the children. So there will be an all about me unit in, in the book cupboard or whatever. Um, I was also, I was I was interviewing somebody yesterday and she, she has children that have just finished up um, primary seven and they, they haven't had their transition process. So there are primary seven children going into school next year that haven't had that traditional, they haven't had their leavers to school, they haven't had their sort of, you know, role of honour, they haven't had their graduation. Um, and that might be quite traumatic for kids. And I think maybe um, it is something quite a lot of schools do. What they do is they get the kids to write a letter about how they're experiencing the new school and send it to the primary teacher in primary seven. So there we've got, you've got the letter writing format. You've got the whole sort of process and how you're feeling about school just now. And it does manage those connections that have been obliterated by COVID. So that, I think that's quite a nice positive thing that you can do with the COVID experience to try and sort of put it right. And it also gets Gets you, gets you known about the kids. Um, something that I do for that particular type of thing is I write the letter that I would have written to my primary seven teacher in first year, and you know I ham it up and kind of go, you know, you, you know, you meant so much to me. You were so inspirational. 
school, you know, and I get all the sort of, you know, the, the really nice vocabulary in the board. But the kids pick up on that. And, you know, that transition from primary seven to first year is so important. And all of our kids have really had that disrupted. So I'm guessing that a lot of English departments will probably be doing work on that anyway for the first couple of weeks. weeks. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Should we go for Kerry's question? What What are your tips for managing your time effectively between work and home? Um, personally, I found this quite difficult. I think that's a, a normal NQT thing is when you go in, you go, right, I need to work all the time. Um, what I did is I structured my time. So I went in at eight in the morning and I left at five. That was a personal choice from me. I was under no obligation to go in early or stay late. Uh, I chose to do that so that I gave myself the time during before and after school as well as the periods that I had without classes to do my work and then when I came home I tried not to do anything until it got to like prelim and folio time and then it was unavoidable but mm -hmm. up until then I gave myself that time in school where I would just sit and do it without taking anything home. Yeah I would say as well um, something that I've learned over the years is try your best to manage your time effectively in school so you'll have non-contact time um, and I know this varies with primary and secondary, but as a secondary teacher, I would sometimes find myself in a non-contact time, getting a cup of tea, um, having a chat, and that's fine. But <laughs> then, yeah, getting a cake or two, and I, I found that I think that's fine. But then I would then think, why am I here at six o'clock at night? And it's because I wasn't using my time effectively. So what I used to do, or still do, um, I'm a bit better with time now, is in my planner, I would write down things that I had to do in my non-contact time. And then I would tick them off. So then at the end of the day, when I was twiddling my thumbs, thinking I had to stay there until six o'clock when I didn't, I could then look at my planner and think, right, okay, I've done that, I've done that. There's no need for me to be here. I can go home. Um, I also, I'm more of a morning person, so I tend to go in early, get organised for the day, and then leave um, once I've got everything organised. Um, and on a Friday, I'm, I'm quite strict with leaving at a reasonable time. So I think you you manage your time as you as you see fit, how it's how it suits your um, your schedule. But definitely try and make the most of your non-contact times because that's the tempting time where you can go for a we chat with a colleague and you know it's, it's a chance to observe other teachers as well on contact times which is a good opportunity for NQTs. I would say that and some of the comments that are coming through just now mentioned that the the, the workload tends to be to do with planning now that will happen at the start of your career but as your career chunters forward you will recognize that it's actually assessment that dominates your life assessment starts to dominate your life in a way that planning doesn't your planning will become um natural and sort of spontaneous as you as you go through your teaching career but assessment is the thing that is that, that loads you down so i would say um try to be canny about the assessments that you generate try to be um be upfront with the children and say, you know, you will be formally assessing four or five pieces of work a year. The rest of it will be formative, it'll be a tick and a jotter, it'll be whatever. You can also um, design assessments that are peer reviewed by um, the, the kids themselves. So try not to be setting big S's all the time. And certainly if you are going to be doing that, try to not clump them all together. Um, um, I would say that the months of November and March are months that you have to try and not factor in any BGE assessments at all because in November, December you're doing your prelims usually and in March you're doing the senior folio. So um, if you've got your year planner, try and think, okay, what is my big assessment for the first year going to be? And it's going to be creative writing because you need a lot of rubbish. You know, they write 15, 20 pages and it's nonsense and you've got to give meaningful feedback for that. So try and anticipate that and put that in a, a spot in the middle of a month where you've not got much else to do and make sure your teaching accounts for not having to read all that nonsense. So get them to write something that's two or three pages, but is stuffed full with good stuff. So not a cast of thousands, you know, be canny with your assessment planning much more than anything else for workload. I think that's really great advice. And, and hopefully well, you, in a school, you'll you'll walk in and you'll, one of the first things to be handed in your pack is, is the year calendar. Um, or maybe even a hotspot calendar. We use that in our school where basically departments say, we've got assessments coming up at this point. And, and partially that's for the kids. You don't want to be landing the kids with tons of assessment um, at the same time at the same point in the year. The other thing about workload as well is, is every school will have a process, you know, um, 
usually run by the union um, or the different unions that are in the school called a working time agreement. And, and in that, it will tell you nominally how much time you should be spending on each part of your, your work day. So it will have time for correction and planning. It will have, you know, tell you when your contact time is, how many meetings you should be having. And, you know, once you've been a teacher for a while, you realize these, these documents, you know, they don't always reflect reality. You're always going to be doing a bit more. Um, well, I don't know if you should always be doing a bit more, but you, you probably will be, especially in your NQT year. But you can always point to that and say, you know, we've had all these meetings. When am I supposed to do all this planning? It's quite difficult as an NQT to do that, though. Um, fantastic, Connor. Thank you for your contribution. We're going to bring everyone back at the end as well. But mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Amy in just now um, and after introducing her really quickly. Um, so if I grab that. Oh, it's still Connor. You get a second, a double dip. Uh, Amy Smith. Amy's from um, Hamilton in South Lanarkshire. Um, she studied English Lit and Theatre. Um, oh, I've changed. I've not changed that grammar. Look at it. Terrible lack of proofreading um, for the, uni the University of Glasgow. And she dabbles in poetry when the mood takes her. You can find her on Twitter at Amy the Scott. So, uh, Amy, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. Excited to be here. Um, yeah. And I know you've had a kind of a, a different route to teaching again. So it'd be interesting just to hear a little, a little bit about your experience of school, your experience of um, university and, and, and your route to becoming an English teacher. Um, yeah, so I really liked school. Um, I'm not going to lie, I was a bit of a bit of a swat, bit of a teepee, bit of a teacher's pet. Um, and I did six years at school and then I went straight into university. I went to the University of Glasgow um, and for my undergrad, I did... English literature and theatre studies. Um, so I did that, got my degree, and then at the end of it, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I walked straight into a job at a bank. Um, it was a call centre in Hamilton. Left after eight weeks, hated it. Didn't get, didn't have a job to walk into. Um, ended up getting a job at another call centre. Um, stayed there for about two and a bit years. So, and then I got a job in retail. Um, so I've kind of been away from the sort of stuff that I did at uni. I've been a, I had been away from it for a good number of years, and then when I was working in my job in retail, I sort of was feeling, you know, this isn't what I want to do with my life. This really is not the path for me. Um, and when I had been at school, in my sixth year at school, I kind of toyed with the idea of either being an English or a drama teacher. And ironically, I'd said to my English teacher one day, I'd said, "Sir, look." I'm really interested in becoming an English teacher if you get any words of advice for me. And he, I swear he looked me dead in the eye and he literally said, don't. <laughs> that just completely cracked me up. Um, I was like, all right, okay, maybe that's not not the not the, part, the plan then. Um, but I sort of went, kind of came back to the idea of I've always loved literature, I've always loved the English language, I've always loved words and, and sort of everything to do with that. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go back to something that I love and maybe I'll be able to hopefully help kids and help other people um, to sort of have that same appreciation. They can get their qualifications and, um, you know, they can they can go on and do something in life that maybe they, they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. So I did my PGDE um, alongside Connor, actually, um, at Strathclyde. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where my sort of journey into teaching kind of takes a slight sort of sidestep um, into a, a, a slightly different direction. So there's Sharon to <laughs> continue the conversation with me. Well, um, when I saw Amy in the class, um, she was teaching a lesson on Dulce et Decorum Est. It's a, it's a real standard beta text, probably around about November um, for, for Remembrance for the remembrance time and I thought Amy was brilliant I thought Amy had a fantastic rapport with the class she inhabited the space really really well the passion was coming out I really thought there's a natural fit you know and I do remember Amy sitting having a, a big long talk with you and the mentor afterwards and it seemed to be that Amy you were um you, you were doing that thing that I think Leanne spoke about earlier on which is only seeing the negative only thinking that things were bad and you know, even although your mentor and me were both sitting kind of going, that was a cracking lesson. You know, you just didn't have that head on. And then when you went to probation, things went great. Yeah, I mean, 
full disclosure before we kind of get into that it's primarily the issues that I were having at the school they were mental health related there, I did have a lot of mental health stuff going on and have done for a few years and that was sort of playing a big role in not having the confidence not feeling like I wanted to be there um, and just really really struggling to sort of get motivated and find sort of any reason for me to actually go and be a teacher um, and that sort of culminated I was at my probationary school I was there for just under two months um, and I had a I didn't have a good time of it to be fair and it was nothing to do with the school or anything like that it was just me and the, the sort of stuff that I was going through so I did eventually take the decision to defer and sort of step away from um, teaching for a year and come back and sort of take that year to sort of figure out what was going on, what sort of help I needed. Um, because if I'd continued, it wouldn't have been fair on me, it wouldn't have been fair on the school, it wouldn't have been fair on the kids. And that's, you know, one of the main things is they need a teacher who's kind of firing on all cylinders and is actually there and wants to do the job. But for me, I really wasn't in a right, the right frame of mind. So I decided to take a step back um, and sort of defer. And I've not taught since, since October last year. So August will be my first time back in the classroom. So, yeah. I think something that's really important to say just now is that Amy, um, Amy actually came into Strathclyde University and spoke to her cohort of um, student teachers from last year. So there might actually be quite a few of you out there that saw Amy speak. And I thought that was a perfect example of what I spoke about at the start. If you have someone in your community who is able to say, listen, it did not work out for me. Um, things didn't go well. Um, I made mistakes. There were mishaps. It's not a perfect journey. That is a really empowering thing within the community. It really helps people to see that there are a range of experiences. And Amy, you made a really big difference to a handful of people that day. Um, I think that was a brilliant thing to be able to do to sort of kind of to own the negative stuff as much as the positive stuff. So are you looking forward to August? Do you know, um, do you know where you're going? I do know where I'm going. Um, I visited the, 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 the school. Um, obviously, it was completely deserted because of um, the pandemic and everything like that. But I've met my PT, um, and one of the first things that she said is, oh, we're really delighted that you're coming. And that just sort of, you know, yeah. it, it gave me this boost of, oh, right, okay, good. Um, so, yeah, but kind of one of the main things that I would kind of say about it is, you know, one of the things that I said, when I did come in and speak at the panel the last time was, you know, it's all right if you don't want to be a teacher at the end of the day. Um, and I know that that's kind of really what I shouldn't be saying in a, in a webinar like this, but I kind of said to the guys, you know, the sky is not going to fall on top of you if you get in there and you realise this isn't what I want to do. You know, I think there's, a, a, particularly for me, and I know for some of the people that I've spoke to before is, um, there's a big expectation of you to go in in your probation year and be absolutely perfect and do everything right and to kind of prove yourself to the people that you're working with that you're actually capable and you can do the job. But you're going to be teaching with people who've been there for, you know, I went to a placement in my student year where the head of the department had been there for 35 years and, you know, is second in command. She'd been there for 16 years and... Um, so you're going to be going into a place where there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have a lot more experience than you. It's okay if you're not perfect. And moreover, it's okay if you spend time there and you realise this isn't working. Like yes. The world will not end if you decide that you don't want to be a teacher. So, Can I just piggyback on what you're saying there, Amy? Because there are a couple of really good questions coming through. There's one here from Kerry and it sort of builds on what you're saying because it's about confidence and, you know, the, the sort of way you're going to feel about this job when you walk in that door and how intimidating it is. And, um, Kerry, you do mention that the training was interrupted by the pandemic, so it feels like it's been a long period of time since you've been in school. Well, um, I think that this is actually, it's quite a strange time for everybody to be going into this because of what's happening, but it actually gives you quite an advantage over students and uh, 
past years because you're going in with a cohort of teachers who have also been away from the classroom for a long, long time and will be very nervous about going back. Mm -hmm. um, and my guess is that a lot of these teachers, like the ones that Amy's talking about, the ones that are long established, maybe like me, quite long in the tooth, when you see people that are coming through that are just at university and, you know, fresh and ready to go, you probably will find that some people in the school look to you for expertise about ICT and expertise about blended learning because you guys have just come out of a sort of a blended learning environment where you've got the you know the visual learning experience and the stuff that's online and my place or whatever format that you use in universities you've been in and you've also had face-to-face -face and you've also had seminars and um, so a lot of teachers out there will probably be looking to you you might actually get quite a, a status in Scottish schools this year that you might not have had before. So I would maybe try and build on that and just remember that everybody's going back into a situation in August that is very, very different and confidence will be shot all over the place so you will not be on your own. Every, uh, everybody will be in exactly the same boat um, and we still don't know what we're going back to. Are we going to go back to a full complement? Are we going to go back to blended learning? So everybody's going to be nervous. Your PT will be nervous. You know, your long-serving members of staff will be nervous. And that's all right. Just embrace that. And, you know, we'll, we'll kind of work it out as we go along. Because I think that's kind of the situation that we're in is, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens come August. And, you know, everybody, your full department should be there to support you. Um, if, if you feel that you're overwhelmed with, if it's going to be blended learning, if other members of the department feel that they're overwhelmed, you should all be working together to sort of do the best that you can, really. That's fantastic. I mean, there's so much great advice um, coming out here and, and so many questions as well. I'm, I'm going to bring everyone back. So I'm going to bring Le Leanne and Connor back. Um, and there's loads of comments, Amy, saying thank you so much for sharing that story. And I think one of the messages we've had today that is that it can be quite easy when everything's going well to say, look at me, aren't I fantastic? And you are going to, you know, it's the Instagram effect. You only see people's best sides, you know, the pictures they want to show. But it's really, really fantastic to hear that that sometimes things don't go right. And um, start off with that theme as we bring people back in. So it's slightly tangential, but earlier on, and I think this is actually from a, um, a secondary teacher, um, uh, not Elizabeth, let's see if I can find it. Um, there was someone saying earlier on, here we go. So um, this is Jamie Lee saying, do you have any advice for NQTs who are feeling a bit pushed out of their own class by the teacher who covers the class on their day out? Should your cover teacher be taking so much lead on your class? Now, I think that's probably a primary teacher because you know, you'll have your um, non-contact time one probably one day a week. Um, and it's great to see that there's people from, from different stages joining us today. But I guess, you know, if you do experience some tension with a teacher in a school or maybe even with your mentor or, or head of department, does anyone have any advice for those sorts of things? You know, it's a tricky question. Yeah, I would I would say if if there if there's tension in the department um that you're in, that that might happen. Um, but I think, as I said before, you will have people that you can go to. You will have people that you can ask questions. Keep in touch um, with, you know, your, your 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 friends from your student year for advice too. That's really crucial. Um, and I, I would say as well, I mean, something that's worked for, not that I've had a terrible experience, and I've not, but something that's worked for me over the years is to kill with kindness. You know, if if you're if you have feel intention with somebody for whatever reason, um, you know, maybe maybe just try and be as kind as possible. Um, I, I, if it gets to the point though where you're uncomfortable, that might then have to go to your mentor. I mean, as a mentor, if an NQT was coming to me and saying I'm not comfortable with the way I'm being treated, etc., then that becomes something that we we support you through. So you will have a mentor to help with that. Um, you should also have a principal teacher um, you know, who, who can also give you advice with that. But I would say anything that you experience where you feel it's getting to the point where you're uncomfortable, speak to your mentor about it and they'll be able to advise you and they'll get, they might know the member of staff quite well. Um, and and that, that's the advice I would give. Yeah, and I always, would... kind of, always kind of go in with the sort of, I realise I'm new at this and I might have got the wrong end of the stick. You know, the, all that sort of kind of, 
that you have to sort of manage your way into a situation like that because you're not going to be a member of that 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 team forever potentially whereas the people that are there have been there for a long time and it's all about reading the room and reading the situation and just going into it, as Leanne says as kindly as you possibly can whilst acknowledging that maybe part of the problem is with you as well that might help to smooth over some of the stuff listen teachers are, are um, teachers are um, they're human and I'll tell you what see teachers that have been out there a long time that aren't enjoying what they're doing anymore that is you know, you will come across teachers like that that are just not loving it. And it is the hardest job in the world to do if you're not loving it. So even if you were to be open to the fact of just how sad that is for them and to try and have some empathy with that before you start escalating it in your head, if you know what I mean. But yeah, there are different types, different types and different stripes everywhere you go. I've got another question here. So we'll try and take a few more. We're beginning to run out of time. We can go a little bit over, but we'll try not to go too far over. So this question um, from Elizabeth is saying, I won't have my own classroom. Any advice on how to organize yourself when you have to move rooms a lot? Well, I actually think at our school, if we do have to do social distancing, our first plan is that the kids stay still and all of us move. So um, I've been thinking about that question as well, but has anyone had any experience of that, of, of not having their own classroom? Yeah. Um, when I was in my, when I did do the time that I did in my, my NQT year, um, there was too few classrooms for the for the amount of staff. Um, and something really simple, I know this is going to sound daft, but having boxes um, for your classes, for their folders, and see if you've got a quick free period or even during lunch or break, just dive into the classroom, grab the boxes, move them to the next class. You don't need to worry about it. They're there. They'll be ready for you to get set up. There's nothing worse than walking into a room that you're not normally in and realising that you don't have the kids' stuff. It's a nightmare because it just it makes you look unprepared to them and that is not what you want to do. So I would say just even boxes that you can put their folders in at the end of the class and just move them. And it takes care of it. Yeah, um, also, um, try and set up an area in that class. Ask for, yeah. I'm all right just to leave all this work here for the next time I'm back in, because it, it would be surprising if the kids were moving to a different class every time with you, uh, rather than you moving to the same class that they're always going to be in. Um, so I'd even ask for it in that classroom, a small area to put your own stuff in, and then that way it's, it's always going to be there for you. It's also yeah. worth negotiating with the class teacher. Um, a space where you can display kids' work as well. That might not always be doable, especially if you're in one of these squash schools that's got a huge population. Um, you just need to be just exercise your judgment with that one. Yeah, I would also say as well, just to add on, um, make sure that you've got your own space as well. So if it's maybe in the base um, or there's, a, there's an area for you where you can have your stuff, if possible, get a locked cabinet. Um, so something, you know, your, your school should have this. Um, but if not, a locked cabinet where you can put documents, um, you know, things that you don't want pupils or anyone else getting a hold of, assessments, etc. Um, that that can be a really, really useful thing to have. And it means you've got your own space as well. You know, a desk, pop a flower on it, you know, <laughs> that, that can, it can make you feel a bit more, more at home. But um, yeah, I understand that that would be a difficult situation, but try and make the most of it. I think negotiating space, having boxes, um, that's that's good advice. Tony's actually got a really good comment here. Tony Sinclair. Hi, Tony. Um, she wouldn't have her own classroom either, but she's planning on getting one of those little IKEA trolley carts. <laughs> That's a great idea. They are really catching on in schools. When I worked in FE, everybody had them and it was like an airport because people were just sort of kind of <laughs> these little things, whatever. But I noticed that actually people are just ca kind of catching on to that. Absolutely. An IKEA trolley cart. And sensible shoes, guys. I spent yeah. two years. I spent two years being itinerant and don't bother with high heels. Just forget it. <laughs> I had high heels for my first month, and my feet were never the same again. Just ditched them. I wear Toms. I wear as flat shoes as I can, as comfy shoes as I can, and I now dart around the classroom. It's great. <laughs> Doc, Mar Doc Martens. It's a good excuse to go down to shoe and get a pair of Doc Martens. And sometimes the kids think they're cool. It depends where you are and what era. <laughs> Oh, um, kids, what they think. <laughs> you can tell there's teachers asking these questions because they're all about um, stationery. You know, are there any particular storage organisational items? And I think that might be what someone was responding to. 
later but you know it's a great excuse to go down paper chase and, and, mm. and buy, buy the place out um absolutely fantastic i'm looking for some more comments etc and people are asking very practical questions i think this one's related to something else as well um josh is asking should we buy posters etc to put up on the walls i want us to broaden that out a little bit should you be buying things for teaching teaching materials should you be spending your wages on on things for school I didn't do a to year, um, but since I was uh, kept on it, I have bought something. Um, but during that year, I said, no, I'm just going to use what's in the school because this might not be my, I was lucky to have a classroom, this might not be my classroom forever. Um, it might be a long time putting stuff up to take it all back down. It might be a lot of expense, especially when you're, your first, usually your first pay is a, a half pay as well because of how the contracts work. So I would say maybe hold off a little bit personally. Yeah, and, and remember as well, I mean, I would always double check the stationery your school has because they will have a store cupboard, they will have stationery available. Get in there quick, <laughs> but um, no, make sure make sure you double check what they've got. Remember as well, when it comes to posters, when it comes to displays, use your pupils' work. You know, use your pupils' work to brighten up your room. Um, I, I would say that I find that you know pupils love coming in, seeing their work on the walls. I think that's more valuable than some posters. Just you know, just think about it. Give yourself some time. Um, same with people asking, you know, what should I buy? What should I get? Just give yourself some time to get a feel of your class, get a feel of your pupils, get, let yourself, you know, get used to you as a teacher and then start to think about that. My experience is maybe slightly different. I mean, I, I've, I've had all of these different experiences, either being an itinerant teacher, i.e. moving from class to class, or, or when I was head of department, I wasn't really in the classroom as much. I would be in the base a lot. But my happiest years were when I was in a class that was mine. And it sometimes takes a wee while for you to get that sense of ownership. And certainly you don't want to be building a shrine in your classroom in the probational year that you have to then leave behind because that's quite upsetting as well. But in answer to what Josh was saying about posters, I think it's really important to have some sort of stamp in the classroom if you can get it that sort of signifies what your cultural interests are. Um, so um, in my class, I would have Bob Dylan up, I'd have Nelson Mandela, I'd have Sylvia Plath. You know, there'd be, you would the people that are your heroes or the people that you would sort of use use those images to bounce ideas around. I would definitely get those up there. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And you don't have to spend an awful lot of money on it. I would say in terms of investing in things that you, you maybe do need, a really good literary um, terms book a really reliable book on literary terms just to keep your subject knowledge right there on the desk in case you ever need to sort of, oh, what's an aphorism again? Oh, what is, you know, how do I define metaphor? Ah, I still have that problem, you know, defining metaphor. It's 25 years on and it's just so good to have a, a, a you know, a, a ready thing there. I'd also have a calendar on the wall, definitely have a calendar on the wall. And I would always, 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 no matter what the stationary cupboard's like, prepared you are, invest in cheap pens because you don't want um, the kids not having something to write with become a communication problem because it does get annoying when they don't have one. Um, but yeah, I'd put up, I'd put up posters um, that now and there. But I do agree with Leanne that really the space in a, a classroom should primarily be for displaying the kids' work. Well, we've, we've we've piled through that really, really quickly. It doesn't feel like that's been an hour, but it has been just over an hour. And I think that's a really great point to finish on, you know, that the, the resources can be a behaviour management issue. I can't believe how many times I had fights over pencils with students when I could have just given them a pencil that cost 5p. You know, it's not worth getting into a massive, and it's not worth it for the student to, to end up having to send them to a head teacher because you've started an argument with them over a pencil, you know. Um, you know, okay, it might cost you a few quid or it might cost the requisition a bit of money, but um, but it's worth doing, you know, um, it's worth doing. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a chance to go into the comments after and maybe answer some questions as well. Um, but we're going to finish up there because we don't want to take over people's evenings. Um, the last question that I think we should go on um, is one to do with, again, work-life balance. And, and I suppose this question is going to come up all the time. How do you switch off when you go home? Um, and and how do you keep the gin budget low, you know? Um, <laughs> what, what do you do? You know, and I thought there's some great advice early on about you just saying to yourself, 
I'm going to come in at eight. I'm going to finish at five. That's already over my hours, it's already over my hours. But, you know, I'm going to stick to it and I'm, and I'm not going to take work home, hopefully. Um, anyone got any quick advice? Solve the, solve the problem here. Just oh. find something you enjoy doing. Sorry, Amy, carry on. No, you're fine. Oh, crack on, Connor, because you yeah. got in really quick. <laughs> yeah. Find something you enjoy doing and just do that when you get in. Like, I come in, I'll sit, I'll play games, I'll maybe just read a book for pleasure. But at the same time, I'm still waking up at three in the morning going, oh, I need to do this tomorrow. Um, like, mm -hmm. it never really leaves your head, but you can still distract yourself from what you're doing. Yeah. Find something you enjoy and just just do that and just try your best just to try and forget about the school. And just to tie in there with what Connor said, with teaching, it's never all done, ever. Um, there's always stuff that you can do. There's always, oh, I'll just turn on the laptop. I'll just double check this. I'll just double check that. My top advice, um, other than relationships, which I think are key building relationships, pupils prioritize. Um, what do you need to do? What has to be done? Prioritize that. Don't be too hard on yourself. You're a human being. The kids will value you as, as, as somebody who looks after themselves. Don't burn yourself out because the kids will feel that. You'll feel that. Prioritise what you what needs to be done. Can I pick up on something that Joanne has said? Yeah, um, so Joanne is saying, I had quite a negative experience in one of my placements and feel this has affected my confidence. How can I start my probation year without that hanging over me? And I think that ties into the question that Tom was asking, which is about that switch off. When things go wrong um, in this job, and they will go wrong, <laughs> um, how do you twist that around so that it doesn't overtake everything? Um, and I read somewhere that although we are not well paid as teachers, um, we never will be well paid as teachers and will never be valued the way that we should be valued in society. There is a sort of matrix for looking at the way teachers receive feedback and where we come up really t high on a list of pre preferable careers is that actually in terms of the feedback that we get from children, we get constant feedback from the children. And you might sort of see in a day-to-day -day basis the ch children being naughty or you know dismissive or not engaging or whatever, but you'll also see the kids responding to you and getting things and having a nice time and feeling welcomed. And that, that level of feedback is the stuff you need to cling to. So, Joanne, whatever it was that happened to you, you're in a new start just now. And remember, as long as you're the best version that you can be, then you're an adult in front of those children that is making all the difference because they might, you might be the only adult in their day that they're seeing that is as good as you. So whatever that bad experience was, just take it and fling it in the bin and think about the good feedback. I think, sure. I think that's the best the best advice to end up on for today is chuck it in the bin if it's not working. And <laughs> if you've got thoughts that aren't working for you, chuck them in the bin as well. Um, and I think it's true. I, I mean, you know, every school isn't for every teacher and every teacher isn't for every school. And you, you might find the probation year is really tough, but then, you know, you get a post somewhere which is perfect for you. And, you know, the, these things change. And, and as Amy said, you know, you, you need to make the changes that you need for yourself as well. Um, mm -hmm really you know there's no point being the best teacher you are you know the best teacher in the world for six weeks and then going sick for six weeks you know yeah. and, got and, you, and you will have good days and bad days you know you'll you'll have days where you think what is going on why did I choose this and then the next day you'll come in and you'll be on an absolute high I mean my highs in a, as an NQT when I think back to just how buzzed I was after a great lesson um you know and nobody can take that away from you it's, it's such a you know, it's such a job that's so close here and, and it's, you know, I, I never want to do anything else. I love teaching um, and I'm glad that I, I pulled through the, the tough days um, because the, the best days are so worth it. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to say goodbye to you and let people get away for whatever they're going to do this evening, you know, whether it's dinner time. Um, give everyone a wave. Good um, luck. Yeah, good, good luck. luck. Great great to You've got this. Okay, absolutely. Got absolutely. Let me just chuck up what I'm meant to be chucking up here, if I can, if I can get it on screen. Let's see if it's working. Goodbye. I'm getting rid of each of you one by one. I have the power here. Um, here we go. And goodbye, Amy. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. That was a, a really fantastic session. And thank you so much for all the kind comments um, that people are leaving. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to absolutely every single question there, but um, I think it was just really great to have a chat about it. Um, I'm so amazed at the experience and the 
um, and all the knowledge that, that teachers have everywhere. And I think it just goes to show that with events like this and, and you know, I know there's Facebook groups out of there and communities to support people, um, that absolutely you can have a great NQT and, and when it's not going so great, you can, you can get over it. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do as SAIT as well is to provide that kind of support. It's specifically aimed at teachers of English and literacy, um, but we will have future events coming up um, pretty soon. Um, we're hoping to have different authors on, different teachers giving um, webinars on how to um, teach certain aspects of, uh, of, of English and, liter and literacy. Um, we've just had a great session from um, Raymond Soltisek on reading for understanding analysis and evaluation. You can see that in our YouTube feed. Um, and I ran a session earlier on um, uh, that's up there now about using G Suite and distance learning um, and Google Classroom. So please go and check those out um, after you finish watching this or, or maybe tomorrow. Um, and to do that and to get notifications whenever we're going live again, um, please click the subscribe button that's just below us, um, just below the video. Um, and that means you'll get notifications um, whenever the channel is uploaded a new video. Um, please follow us as well on Twitter at at SateFeed. Um, and if you check that out on Twitter, we'll have a tweet up pretty soon with the um, Twitter details for all of our guests today. Twitter is, you know, really, really great, actually, for sharing resources and finding out about things all around the world. So um, please subscribe to us there. Um, Thank you for joining us today. Um, what a fantastic session. Um, good luck to all of you in the teaching profession. Good luck with your summer holidays and um, making the most of them. And please don't start working too soon. Um, you know, there's plenty of time to relax before, as Connor said, you start waking up early in the morning thinking about what do I need to do? Um, you're joining the best profession in the world. And if you're an English teacher, the best part of that profession. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>